Good morning. Welcome. I'd like to apologize in advance. I speak many different languages, C, SQL, PL SQL, Java, and so on. But uh, Portuguese is, is not included in that list. So I'll be presenting in, in English this, this morning. But my name is Tom Kite. I've been with Oracle a little over 17 years now. When I first joined, Oracle version 6 was in production. Version 7 was the brand new release that was just coming out, and that was followed by 7.1, 7.2, 7.3, and so on. So 17 years and about 16 different production releases of the, the database later. Uh, I'm here to talk to you this morning about 11G release 2. And I'm going to go through 11 different things about 11G release 2. Uh, but they're going to be 11 things that you may not have heard about. They, they won't be huge features like you'd hear at Oracle Open World or from Larry Ellison on a stage. These are things that as I was going through 11G Release 2, I said, ah, this is something I've asked for or this is something I've had a need for for a long time. This is really pretty cool. So there are sort of features that haven't gotten a lot of exposure but I think you'll find at least one or two of them to be something that you'll jump on and be able to use right away as you get into the new release. So the first one I'll talk about is the thing I call do-it-yourself parallelism. The basis for this is you have some large statement or some long-running stored procedure that's going to update millions of records or this stored procedure is going to read a lot of records, do a process, and then update the record back in the database. But these are sequential statements. Even if I use parallel query, I could break the statement up into a lot of pieces and have it execute faster, but it would be one large transaction. And Murphy's law or Murphy's rule is such that the longer a SQL statement runs, the more data it touches the higher the probability it will fail with one minute left to go. So many times we want to take these really big statements and break them up into smaller pieces so that if part of it fails, that's okay. We just lose a little bit of work. Uh, but we can come back and do that little bit of work again later. So this is a new database feature that basically allows us to take a large statement, a long-running stored procedure, and break it into very small pieces that we can then run concurrently. So there's some parallelism here. But we can also run in a manner such that if one of them fails, or many of them fail, we can come back and fix the reason they failed. They ran out of space. They ran out of some resource. We can correct that and rerun just those components. So if the update was able to update 99% of the table, we didn't lose that 99% work. We just have to come back and, and do the remaining 1%. I used to do this manually myself all the time. If you were to go on Ask Tom and search for do-it-yourself parallelism, you'd see a process, how to do this. You could implement this yourself. But it, it takes a while. It takes some knowledge. It takes some infrastructure. It takes some amount of coding. The thing with the do-it-yourself parallelism was make it easy make it standard, build in all the capabilities one would need in order to do this on a recurring basis. Make it so that five minutes after you decide to do it, you're already able to do it because the infrastructure is there. So what I used to do is take a large table, for example, that I wanted to update every row or run a stored procedure against, and I'd run a, a relatively large script against it that would go into the data dictionary and break the table up into row ID ranges. So I could get 10 or 20 pairs of row IDs that if I used a where clause where row ID between the low row ID and the high row ID, I'd get a small slice of the table. And if I took all of the pairs and ran a query with the where clause, I would get the entire table. 
Now, once I got those row ID pairs, I'd then have to write a job using DBMS jobs that would take those row IDs as input and then schedule those jobs to run, run those jobs, review which ones worked, which ones didn't, fix them, and so on. So it was doable, but it was very manual. In 11G release two, these will be the steps we go through. I'm gonna create a table to test with. So I have this table T. It's not gigantic, but it's large enough to demonstrate the concept with. This table has about 1,000 blocks. I would like to process this table approximately in 10% pieces. So I wanna break the table up into at least 10%. So I, as a DBA or developer, would just simply have to figure out how many blocks is 10%. That's about 100 blocks will get me 10% of the table. So what I'm gonna do then is, this is for my application. As I'm processing each chunk, I'd like a log of what happened. I'd like to know the row ID range that it covered, how many rows it affected, and when it started and when it finished. So this is part of my application. This is just something you may or may not do. Then I'm gonna have a stored procedure. This stored procedure used to simply do a long running update. It updated every row in the table. Update T said object name equal lower of object name. And that was the extent of the stored procedure. Now I'd like to break it up. So what I had to do was, was add parameters to my stored procedure, the row ID range, add that to my where clause, where row ID is between those two chunks, now this stored procedure will be invoked automatically by the database using this new do-it-yourself parallelism, get the row ID ranges and update just that slice of the table. The rest of the stored procedure is just my logging, my own little audit trail. Here's the magic, here's the, the new interface. Use dbms parallel execute, new package, create a task. You give it any name you would like. Then you call dbms parallel execute, and one of the API calls you could use is create chunks by row ID. Another way to create chunks would be by primary key ranges. So if you were using a sequence, they could break the table up into slices as well by the primary key. But I've told it to take the table user.t, don't break it up by rows, break it up by database blocks, I know how many blocks I want in each chunk, and make each chunk be about 100 blocks in size. And so what it did was it populated a dictionary table for me, and this is a new DBA and user view that you can peek into, and we can see all the row ID ranges for this. And it broke my table up into at least 10 different pieces. And right now, the status of each piece is unassigned. Nobody's working on it yet, hasn't started. Other statuses could be processing. As this stored procedure is running in the background using the scheduler, uh, it's gonna grab off individual chunks and assign them to a specific job. So we can see ones that haven't been processed yet, the ones that are in process, the ones that have processed successfully, and the ones that have been processed but had an error. And we have other columns to, to explain to us what those errors are. So all I've done now is break the table up. I haven't actually run anything. The next thing I'm gonna do is actually run the task using dbms parallel execute. I give it the task name. This is the SQL statement I wanted to use. I could have put an update there. I could put an insert there. I could put a delete there. You can put a stored procedure there. All you'll be doing is putting a SQL statement that will take those two bind variables, start ID and ID the database has automatically created jobs using DBMS scheduler, and what I decided to do was run two of those jobs at a time. I had a relatively small machine. I broke the table up into at least 10 pieces. I didn't want to run all 10 simultaneously. That was too much for my machine. I want the database to run two of them concurrently. So what will happen is they'll create a, a scheduler job such that two jobs will be executing. These two jobs will go to this queue table where the row ID ranges are, find the first two unassigned records in there and start processing them. And when they're done, they'll update the status and move on to the next row. So in the background, I was in effect doing parallel two against these 10 pieces. After they were all done, the status turns into processed 
my update has completed, I would review the statuses, make sure they all completed successfully. If they had not, correct the error condition and re-invoke the execute run task. And it would pick up the unprocessed, the, the error ones, and re-execute them. And you would keep doing that until eventually they all got complete. Then you can drop that task. That clears out those row ID ranges. And if I go and look in DBMS parallel execute chunks, they're gone. But since my stored procedure had its own little audit trail, that would persist. This is part of my application. And I can see the row ID ranges, the start times and the end times, so I can have some historical information about how long each chunk took and how many rows were processed in each chunk and so on. So this becomes a very easy way to do this processing, you know, breaking up that long-running batch statement without having to write all the underlying infrastructure code yourself. The second one, some new analytic functions. I have written before that analytics are the coolest thing to happen to SQL since the keyword select. Okay, select was added in 1979. These analytic functions were added in about 1998, 1999 with version 8i. Okay, so analytics have been around for a couple of releases and every release they add a couple more. So a new one they've added, one called listag. This is one of those functions that when I saw it, I said, this is something I've been waiting for for a long time. Because with listag, what we're able to do is have a, a delimited list of character strings produced as the result of a group by. So this is the result I want. I want to be able to go to the emp table, group by depno, and get a delimited list of the employees that work in there. So starting in 9i release two, they gave us the ability to write a user-defined aggregate. And the first user-defined aggregate I wrote was called string ag. And it did exactly this. But in order to use it, you needed to install my PL SQL object type, my SQL object type, uh, all my PL SQL code, the user-defined aggregate function, and then you could start using the built-in capability string ag. But it required installing code. You couldn't re you couldn't rely on it just being there in the database. It wasn't a standard built-in function. So starting in Tenji, they gave us another way to do this string aggregation. And that's the query on this next page. I could go against the employee table, and using this row number built-in, I could break up the table by department number, order it by employee name, and assign sequential numbers. So in department 10, Clark would get the number one, King would get the number two, Miller would get the number three. In department 20, Adams would get the number one, Ford two, Jones three, and so on. Once we did that, we'd be able to use a connect by query. We'd start with row num one, so get the first record in each department, and then connect it to the second record in each department, and then the third, and then the fourth, and the fifth, and so on. And then using a built-in function sysconnectby path, that would string everything up, and then we could just group by depno, get rid of all the records we didn't want, and you get the answer. It's quite simple, right? I mean, anybody could sit down and write this query just in five seconds, because it's, it's right on the tip of your tongue. It's a relatively complex query. It doesn't perform very well. The PL SQL implementation from 9i typically outperformed this, because this would have to explode out a large hierarchy and then squash it down to just a few records. So it worked, but it wasn't efficient, and it wasn't quite intuitive. It was a relatively complex implementation. 11G release two, this is what it becomes. There's now the built-in list ag, finally. So this is just one of about 40 or 50 analytic functions inside the database. And if you haven't played with the analytic functions, like I demonstrated row number and list ag now, if you haven't played with those, you're missing out on a big part of SQL. The syntax is a little bit awkward at first. It takes a couple minutes to get your head around, you know, using the row number function, how I need to break the data up and use order buys in order to create windows and whatnot. But once you get the analytics in your head, you'll find yourself able to solve problems in SQL that you didn't even think about trying to solve in SQL before. They give you a lot of capability. Another new analytic function, nth value. For a long time, we've had these analytic functions, first value and last value. 
they would allow you to break the data up by something. Here I'm breaking it up by a department num number. Order the data within each department, by employee name in this case, and then I could get the last value after breaking it up by department, sorting it by e-name in each group, and the first value. That was great. But sometimes you don't need the first and the last. Sometimes you need the second or the third, or in general, the nth observation in a window, especially if you're doing statistical analysis. You, you want to throw away outliers. You explicitly don't want the first and last values after sorting by something. You want the second or third so that you don't have those, those far outlier values. And that's what the nth value allows you to pick up. So I can say, give me the third value within that group instead of the first or the last. And that would give us a result set similar to this. So I can get the information I need. I can pick it off with this nth value. The third one, execute on a directory. In Oracle 8.0, we started having this object called a directory object. And in 8.0, you could grant read on a directory. And the only thing a directory was used for back then was for B files, to get a binary file out of the operating system. Starting in 9i, we started using directories not only to read objects from the file system, but using util file to write objects into the file system. So we could grant read, we could grant write on a directory. In 11G release 2, you can now grant read, write, and execute. Execute must mean, at some level, we're able to run code now in a directory. And you are. You're able to run code via an external table. An external table, the ability to query a file in the file system as though it were a database table. So you could take a file that had comma-separated values in it, and very much like writing a SQL loader script, script in the database via a create table statement, how to read that file, how to parse that file, and you could now select star from the file. With this new preprocessor, you're able to select star from a program run against a file, which is an interesting concept. What if you had a compressed file in the file system and it contained comma-separated value data? So you've got this large compressed file, it's got all your information in it, but it's in a binary compressed format. In 11G release 1 and before, you would have had to have uncompressed the file into the file system in order to process it. Either, either via SQL loader or an external table. In 11G release 2, we can leave it compressed in the file system and just select star from the compressed file. Because what we'll do, actually, is select star from G unzip, an uncompression uh, routine. So we'll select star from a program. The program will run against the file. It will uncompress the file, write it to standard out, and allow us to read it. And this is what it might look like. You would set up two directories, one where your data will be and one where your programs will be. Then when you create your external table, you do what you would normally do. You set up the script that tells Oracle how to parse, interpret that file. However, we have this new directive, preprocessor. And what I said was, I want you to run a script called run underscore g unzip dot sh. That's a script I wrote against the file named emp.dat.gz. So I've got the compressed data in the file system, and I'm going to run this program against it. The rest of the setup, here's my file. I have a gzip compressed file. I have my script, run gunzip.sh, and the entire contents of the script is just two lines, the header line and run user bin dash c that writes the standard out, against whatever file name was passed into me, the dollar sign star. Okay, so the script was real simple, and all I need to do is select whatever columns I want from my external table, where clause or whatever. Oracle ran my program, uncompressed the file to standard out, parsed the information, and sent it back. Now this was interesting, and I thought for a minute, what else can I do with this? Because many times when they give us these features, there's other things you can do with this that nobody thought of yet. Well, I got to thinking about directories and how util file was used with this. And I thought about the util file package. 
And with util file, I can do all kinds of file-oriented things. I can create files. I can append to files. I can rename files. I can copy files. I can delete files. I can do lots of things to files. I can do everything except ask what files exist out there to have something done to them. We have no way in the database to read a directory right now. If I wanted to do that, I'd have to write a Java stored procedure in order to accomplish that. Or maybe I could just create a table I'll call ls. And that table just has a line in it as a column. And that table is based on a preprocessor directive, run run underscore ls.sh against itself. So I'm just going to run the program against itself. And the only thing in this script was user bin ls. And when you run that and you select star from it, you get your directory listing. And it's a real easy way to do that. So then think about the other ones you could do. You could probably create a table called ps, another one called iostat, another one called vmstat. You know, whatever you have that writes the standard out can now become a table source. A lot of people have wanted to run export from within the database. Right? And so they could have done that. They would use the, the DBMS scheduler. And they'd have to create a program, create a job, schedule the job, run the job, and then find out a way to read the output of export so they could see what it was doing. Well, now you could select star from an export, for example. So any sort of application that produces output on the screen can now be run by the database and select it from so you can get that output easily in your application. The next one, number four, recursive subquery factoring. This is taking the with subquery that was added in, I believe it was Oracle 9i, where I could begin a query with the word with instead of select. And I could go with view name as some query and then select star from that view name. So it was a way to sort of factor out some complex SQL, put it at the top of the SQL statement, and refer to it later. They've extended this in 11G release 2 to make it recursive. And this is an ANSI SQL extension. And so this is something other databases support. And basically what it is is a complete replacement for connect by. It can do everything a connect by can do. It can do things that connect by cannot do as well. So it's sort of a superset of the connect by capability. It can be easier to understand than connect by. You know, everybody can sort of remember the first time they saw a connect by query. It looked complex. It looked mysterious. Looking at this, it will look complex. It will look mysterious. But it could be a little bit more intuitive than a connect by. That is, unless you've been using connect by for 22 years, then it just looks confusing. Right? It's just a different way to do the same thing. Our goal is going to be to create this result set, the standard imp hierarchy. Start with king, show everybody that works for king and everybody that works for them, and so on. Here is the recursive with query you would use to do this. You would start with the with statement, with view name. Here's the columns I'm going to select, as. And then you're going to have a query that always has a union all. There will be two pieces to it, union all together. The first part in red on line three is equivalent to the start with clause for the connect by query. I'd like to find everybody whose manager is null. So that's the person who doesn't report to anyone else. In the emp data, that is just the king record. Once we found that one record, the king record, we feed it into the second part of the union all query. And here's where the recursion comes in. We're building a view name emp data. We're selecting from emp data in the definition of emp data, hence the recursion. And so what we're going to do is take that king record, and we're going to send it into the second part of the query, and we're going to join the king record to the employee table again, and we're going to find everybody who works for king. And so that we'll find those three records. Once we found those three records, they'll be fed back into this second part of the subquery as well. And the second time through, we'll find everyone who works for someone who works for King. 
And they'll keep doing that until eventually we found everyone. And if you run this particular query, this is the output you get. So it's the, the standard connect by. What else can you do with this? You can use this to generate data. Sometimes you need to do time series analysis. You need to produce a report that has an observation for every day in a week or every day in a month or every month in a year and so on. Your data may not have a record for every day in the week or every day in the month. So frequently we need to generate a set of dates between some range and use that in an outer join to sort of fill in the missing gaps. Before, we probably would have created a database table and put the data there. With this ANSI SQL recursive with subquery factoring, we can do it a different way. We can say, with, with some data, let's start with select one from dual. So we get the first record out of dual, the only record out of dual. Then we feed that into the union all part, and what we'll do is select one plus one from data where one is less than five. That will produce two. And then we'll feed that back into the recursive subquery. Select two plus one from data where two is less than five, and so on. And this will actually generate for us five rows. The numbers one through five, and all we have to do is add that to sysdate, and boom, we get those sequential dates. So you can use it as a data generator. A third interesting use of this is, many of you probably like to start the day with a crossword puzzle or perhaps doing a Sudoku puzzle. If you'd like to start the day doing a Sudoku puzzle, you're in luck, because you could now use this SQL statement, this recursive with subquery factoring, to solve any Sudoku puzzle. I'm gonna pull up a, a, a web log that will give us the SQL statement. Okay. Come on. Hello. And it's, it's not, there it goes. Excellent. So you have a Sudoku puzzle. We've seen these before. You have to fill in the missing numbers, right? If you were a Java programmer, you could sit down and write a Java programmer, C programmer. You, you could come up with a procedural algorithm to solve this. Well, somebody sat down with a SQL statement and said, I tell you what, you give me this string, which is basically the Sudoku puzzle, where the blanks represent the missing numbers, and I'm gonna feed it into this query. And if you run this query in SQL plus, here's what will happen. I'll give you back a string that will fill in all of the missing numbers. Now, you might not use this to do your Sudoku puzzles, the reason I point this out is you can do some pretty interesting stuff with this recursive subquery factoring. All of a sudden, SQL has set-based operations, which has had since the beginning of time. It has iteration and procedural operations. We gave you that in, in Oracle 10G with the model clause. And now it has recursion. It has all of the concepts you need for any sort of high-level programming language. So you can start to think outside the box with, what can I do with this that I couldn't do before? And you might be able to solve problems purely in SQL that you would have had to written a lot of code for in the past. So that was just an interesting one. Improved time travel. Way back in version four of Oracle, we added a feature to the database called read consistency. Version three gave us a feature, multi-versioning, that gave us non-blocking queries. Version four gave us read consistency. In version four, what this meant was, if I logged into the database at nine o'clock in the morning, and I opened up a cursor, I didn't fetch any data from it, I just opened a cursor, and I waited six hours till the middle of the afternoon, and then I started fetching data from that cursor, in version four, the data that came out of the query six hours later would have been whatever was in the database six hours before. When you opened up the result set, we already knew what the answer was before we even touched any of the data. And that was the multi-versioning so and, and the read consistency. So when you open the query, the result set was fixed as of that point in time, no matter how long the query took to run. In version 9i, we extended this capability by giving you flashback query. 
in Nine-Eye, you could open a query and say, what would the answer have been if I had opened this six hours ago? So you would be able to pick the point in time at which the query would run. And this is pretty cool. So in the middle of the afternoon, you could say select star from the table as of six hours ago, and you'd get that result set out. Now, as soon as we introduce that, people would ask the question, hmm, can I use this for my audit trail? Right? I've got triggers on my table that every time somebody does an update or delete, I save the old values in another table. Can I use this to have those old values instead of running my triggers? My, the triggers make my transaction two or three times as large as it used to be, and triggers are not fast in the first place. So I'd like to turn that off if I could. And the answer to that with flashback query was no, because flashback query had a theoretical limit of five days. And I say it was theoretical because it was based on undo. In order to flashback query six hours ago, the undo that was generated for the last six hours has to be available to us, the rollback information. In order to flash back five days ago, five days of undo has to be available to us. And I don't know of any DBA that would keep five days of undo on disk. They, they just don't do it. It's too much. So the five-day limit was theoretical. It's really more like a couple of hours in the past. And it worked well, and it worked for what it, it did. And furthermore, even if the DBA did keep five days' worth of undo on disk, you probably wouldn't like using it too much. Because in order to do a flashback query, we have to sequentially undo every change to a block that's been modified as we hit it. Meaning if I flashback query one hour ago, I'm going to get a database block from the database, ask the database, has it been modified in the last hour? If so, apply the undo to it, get the previous version of the block, and then ask the database, has this block been modified in the last hour? And if so, roll it back again. So if that database block was modified 50 times in the last hour, there would be 50 I.O. operations in order to roll it back. Well, if it's been modified 50 times in the last hour, maybe it's been modified 100 times in the last two hours, 200 times in the last four hours, and so on. Right? The further back in time you flash back, the more undo we have to apply. So the further back in time you flash back, the longer the flashback query takes to execute. So flashback query, the 9i implementation of it, was not very scalable. The further back in time you flash back, the longer the query would take to execute. So we needed another way to do this if we wanted long-term data retention. So 11G release one introduced this thing called a flashback data archive. This gave us the ability on a table-by-table -table basis to flash back query a table as of five days ago, five weeks ago, five months ago, whatever. And it did it by generating data into a flashback data archive. Our application would perform normal DML operations, inserts, updates, and deletes. This, of course, generates undo information because we need to be able to roll that back. With the flashback data archive, after we commit our transaction, a new background process, FBDA, the flashback data archiver, would read the undo information in the background, not as part of our transaction, find undo for tables that the DBA said, I need to be able to query these for a long time. It would take that undo, apply it, roll back the change, get the original record, and then insert it into the flash data archive. So this was a way to have that long-term data retention without having to code the trigger, which is nice, and without having the performance penalty of the trigger, which is even better. It's just taking the undo we've already generated and another process in another transaction in the background creates the before image record and inserts it for us. So our application, if it was doing 100 transactions per second before turning this on, will still be doing 100 transactions per second afterwards. The initial implementation of this in 11G release one was a little bit restrictive. If you put a table into the flash data archive, you could no longer truncate that table. You could no longer drop a column from that table. You could no longer drop the table. You could no longer do anything to the table 
that did not generate undo information because this was based purely on the availability of the undo. So it really limited what the DBA could do to manage this table. You could add a column to the table, but you couldn't get rid of a column. So it was a little bit inflexible. In 11G release 2, they've removed all of those limitations. You can now truncate the table, and the database will simply put a placeholder into the flash data archive saying, hey, as of this point in time, this table was effectively empty. Everything was gone, right? So it can survive truncates. It can survive drop columns. You can drop a column from your table. We're not going to drop it from the flash data archive. You'll have the ability to still query that column, you know, because if you dropped a column last week and you do a flashback query to two weeks ago, that column existed back then. So we remember that column used to be there. If you flashback query to a point in time when that column existed, you're able to query it. You can see the values that were there. So you can get rid of it from your production table, but we're going to keep it in the archive. And in the event you want to do something massive to the table, like a, a complete reorganization of it, rebuild it as a partition table, for example, you can actually disassociate the table from its history. So the DBA would come in and, and stop work on the table for a minute, disassociate it from the history, perform this reorganization, do whatever they need to it, and then reassociate it with the history. So basically, you can perform any operation on a table in the Flash Data Archive that you could on a table that's not in the Flash Data Archive. You might have the extra step of a disassociate and a reassociate, but you have the capability to do everything now. Number six, you've got mail. Many times, I've had a requirement that as a file arrives in a directory, I need to do something with that file. I need to load it in the database. I need to process it and put the process data in the database. I need to do... I need to do something with the file and then get it into the database proper. In the past, I'd have to run a cron job, for example, or use Enterprise Manager to create a recurring job, or do something at the operating system level to get the file in there. Now, the database itself can watch for these objects, watch for these files, and as they arrive, generate an event, and typically that event would be run this stored procedure, and that stored procedure can do whatever it wants to the file. And the way this would look would be something like this. The first thing I'm going to do is create a credential. The files are arriving in some directory. I want to process them. I don't want to necessarily do this as the Oracle super user account. I'm going to be running from the database that usually runs as Oracle. I might not want to do that. Right? Typically, I'm not going to want to do that for security reasons. So what I do is store in the database a set of operating system credentials. This is the identity the database will now use to access this file system. It will run as this user instead of as the Oracle super user itself. The next thing I'll do is implement my application. So my application is going to want to load these files into this table I call files. So I'm going to use a directory object. This is part of my application, not part of this new file capability. But I'm going to create a directory in the file system. And I'm going to create a database table for my application. And then this is my application. My process files, its goal is going to be insert a record into the files table and load a clob, a large object, into that row that I just inserted. The new part here is this scheduler file watcher result. This is all the metadata about the new file that just arrived. Things like the file name, the directory, the timestamp, the size, all of the information I need to process that file. And so here, I start by putting in the file timestamp, the directory path, and the file name, and an empty clob. And then I use dbms lob load from file to populate that clob from the operating system. This is the stored procedure this new file watcher thing is going to be invoking inside the database. So now how do I get this set up and running? The steps would be to use DBMS Scheduler to create a program. My program is named, in this case, file watcher. That's my own name. It's going to be a stored procedure called process files. 
That is just simply the stored procedure I just wrote. So I'm creating a program to run my stored procedure. It gets one argument, one parameter, and that parameter is the event message. And that is simply the metadata about the file that arrived. And so you're always going to do something similar to this, create a program, define the metadata, the parameters for that program. Then you're going to create the file watcher. I give it a name. I tell it what directory to look in. And I tell it what files to look for. In this case, I'm interested in every single file that comes there. I'd like you to use these credentials when processing with the operating system. Don't use the Oracle account. And the job's not enabled right now. I haven't started it yet. I'm going to create my job. Uh, I need to name the program that I'm running. That's the program we just created. You can put event conditions in there. And in this case, I just want to make sure that I only processed files that were greater than 10 bytes in size. And this was simply to demonstrate the, the capability. So you can put filters here. Uh, in addition to the star that we did on the previous screen to process every file, you can have other more complex relational conditions along with that. Then I enable that job, let it start running. And you sit back and you wait for a couple minutes. And all of a sudden, you'd see every file that was in that directory populate it into this database table. Now, this is a little bit of an incomplete example. Because all I did was I loaded the file into the database. I left the file in the directory. In real life, you would do other things, like you would erase the file after processing it. You would move the file. Uh, I might have a primary key on this table so that I could remember that I had processed a given file so that if I was run against the same file later, uh, it would have a unique constraint violation, whatever. So there's some missing code here, but this demonstrates the capability. As files arrive, the database will pick them up and give them to you. Number seven, deferred segment creation. Normally, when you created the table, the initial extent was always allocated. And there was no way around this. The only tables that did not do this were temporary tables. They would create their initial extent when you use them in your session. Now every table Every segment, really, has the ability to have that initial extent deferred, not allocate it until later when we actually use it. So in the past, segments, tables, indexes, everything, normally allocate it an initial extent. They might be small. Like, typically, there may be 64K if you're using locally managed table spaces with system allocated extents. But if you do something small, 64K, over and over and over again, it gets big. Right? So if you have hundreds or thousands of 64K extents, you're talking about a lot of storage all of a sudden. Not only that, but you're talking about a lot of rows in your data dictionary. And the problem is, a lot of third-party applications do actually create thousands of tables, but end up only using hundreds of them. They install their entire schema, but they don't use a lot of it. Well, we'd like to use this deferred segment creation to put off that initial extent allocation until we actually put data in the table. So this is the way it would look. I'm going to turn off this feature. I'm going to set it to false. And I'm going to create a simple table with three columns, a couple of constraints. If you were to query the data dictionary right after this table was created, you would find that this small table actually allocates five initial extents, one for the table, one for the primary key index, one for the unique constraint index, one for the large object, and one for the index on the large object. So there's five extents out there, but we haven't put any data in the table yet. If I turn this feature on, I set deferred segment creation equal true, and I create a second table and rerun that query, I don't see any change in user extents. I just have the ones from T1 still, because we haven't put anything in the table. And until we actually insert a record in that table, so I insert record populating that first row, that's what triggered the extent creation. So the act of putting data in the table does this. I should point out that in 11G release 2, this feature, deferred segment creation, is enabled by default. Meaning if you install 11.2 version and you create a table and you query the data dictionary, there won't be anything in DBA extents. It doesn't exist yet. The segment has not been created. So you see the table in the data dictionary, but you won't see any storage for the table in the data dictionary yet. 
So this may affect some scripts that you have. Uh, I just did a second edition of my last book, Expert Oracle Database Architecture. It affected almost every script I had in that book because I would frequently say, look, I create this table and we look at the data dictionary and in the second edition I would have to say, and we see absolutely nothing. If you've heard of a database machine called Exadata, you might have heard of a feature it has called a flash cache. This is not the Exadata flash cache. This is a feature available to Oracle running on the Solaris platform or Enterprise Linux. So this is a feature that's available not on the Exadata machine, on regular Oracle, but only on the Solaris and Enterprise Linux platforms right now. And what this flash cache does is allows us to use very inexpensive, cheap, solid state disks as a secondary SGA a secondary shared global area. We can use this to extend effectively the size of our database buffer cache to these solid state devices. Solid state devices are really good for read speeds. They're fast to read from. They're not so good for write speeds. They're not as fast at writing as you might think they are. And the inexpensive ones we're talking about using here are very unreliable. They don't last forever. They have a very high failure rate because the memory that backs them can only be written to so many times before they, they stop working. So we don't want to store our data files on these cheap disks, but we'd like to be able to use them to speed up our database operations. And the way this would work is you install the, the solid state disks, you set up the flash cache. I now have a buffer cache that's measured in tens of gigabytes. I have a database that's typically measured in hundreds or thousands of gigabytes. And I can have this flash cache area that's going to be measured in hundreds of gigabytes as well. I start up my database, and somebody issues a query. The blocks are not in the buffer cache yet, so we have to read them in. And they go in the buffer cache. So far, no different. At some point, the buffer cache runs out of space. And we need to get that block from the SGA onto disk. So the database block writer would write it out to disk. With the flash cache, database block writer will also write it out to the solid state disk. And in the buffer cache, it will leave a very small pointer saying if you ever need this block again, you could get it from disk, but you could also get it from the flash cache. You don't have to go to the spinning magnetic disk to get this you could go off to the solid state device. So DB writer is going to do a parallel write and put it into both locations and in the buffer cache with a very small pointer, remember where it is. The next time we need that block, we're going to read it back out of the flash cache into the SGA. Now, if the SGA was approximately 100 times faster than disk, which in most cases it can be, it's, it's, it's a two orders magnitude faster than getting it off of disk, the flash cache won't be as fast as the SGA, but it's going to be some 40 to 50 times faster than getting it from disk. So we would still prefer to get it from the SGA. So still make your SGA nice and generous, big, but use this flash cache and you're going to offset the slowness of disks over time. If I was to shut down and restart my database, I would lose the contents of my flash cache because I would lose all those small pointers in my SGA. So the longer my database is running, the faster my database will become using this new flash cache technique. And again, this is available on Solaris and Enterprise Linux. The next one is some improvements to Parallel Query. Parallel Query was invented with version 716 of Oracle in 1994. That's 16 years ago. 16 years ago, a big machine, a big open systems machine, had maybe 512 megs of RAM. Meg, not gig. So to have 512 megabytes of memory in 1994, that was a huge machine. And the CPUs back in 1994, you had fewer of them, and they were a lot slower. Now, over the last 16 years, the amount of memory we have in machines has gone up astronomically. 512 gigabytes is not unreasonable these days. But in general, tens to hundreds of gigabytes of RAM is available. And we have lots of 
cores and CPUs that can process the data, and they're running at a speed that is just phenomenal compared to the computers back then. I think my cell phone has a faster CPU than a computer of 1994 would have had at that point in time. So the CPU and the memory has gone up really fast. The disk capabilities has gone up, but not quite as fast. Disk performance, if you compare it today versus 1994, it would be better, but it would not be as better as the CPU and the memory. Now, the Oracle Parallel Query algorithms had not really changed significantly since 1994. Starting with 11G Release 2, they made three major changes. The first one is a better automated degree of parallelism. The first question a DBA would ask when using Parallel Query was, what is the best degree of parallelism? And the answer to that is, it depends. Right? Uh, it, it depends on the query being run. It depends on what tables I'm joining to. It depends on how large the segment is right now. It depends on a lot of factors. But in the past, the DBA would have to try and assign a degree of parallelism, where a developer would do it at the query level using a hint. It wasn't a good way to come up with the best degree of parallelism. Using 11G, we're going to take a different approach to parsing queries. A query is going to come in. It hits an object that parallel query is permitted against. The DBA did an alter table, table name, parallel. The first thing the database will do is generate a serial plan. No parallel query at all. And it will come up with an estimate for how long that query will run. And if that query is going to run faster than fast enough, the DBA has set up a threshold, parallel min time threshold. If the query is going to run faster than that, we're just going to use the serial plan. So that's new. In the past, if I made a table parallel, pretty much most of my queries against it were going to be parallel, even if the parallel query took longer than the sequential query would have. So here, if we come up with a good serial plan, we'll use it. If not, we're going to send it through the optimizer again and come up with a parallel plan. But the degree of parallelism that's assigned to each segment will be based on many factors. What is the query? If I'm joining two hash partition tables together, and they both are hash partitioned into eight partitions, and they're both hash partitioned on the join key, maybe the best degree of parallelism for each of those segments would be eight in this case. And we'll just do an eight-way parallel partition-wise join. Later on, I might query that same table again and ask the question, how many rows are in the table? So it's just going to full scan this table. Now it might look at it and say, you know, I'm just hitting this one table. Parallel 32 is the right answer, because the partitioning scheme doesn't help me at all here to count rows. I'll just break the table up into 32 pieces and run concurrently against it. So it will sign the degree of parallelism based on many factors, not just one static number. So that's an improvement. The second one is parallel statement queuing. Parallel Query was invented in 1994 to allow a single user to use all of the resources on a given machine. In the year 2010, we no longer want that to happen. Because if we let one user use all the resources on a machine and 10 users decide to run simultaneously, you have a, a real performance problem. You can't do 10 users trying to utilize the entire machine simultaneously. With parallel statement queuing, we recognize that. We start running parallel queries. The machine is getting 100% utilized. The CPU, disk resources, everything are getting up at 100%. Somebody else tries to come in and run a parallel 32 query. Instead of just throwing them out there at the operating system and taking the operating system over the edge, we're going to put them in a queue. We're going to make them wait until those resources become available. So rather than overwhelming the machine and making everybody run incredibly slow, We'll run just as many as we can, and as the resources become available, pull those off of the queue and start them running. Okay, so we'll be able to better utilize our resources. And the third one has to do with memory utilization. In the past, parallel query would typically start with a checkpoint operation. It would flush the buffer cache. So parallel query, its goal was to get all of the data out of the cache and onto the disk so that we could use direct I.O. to read the data in efficiently. 
If we had a million blocks to process, getting a million blocks out of the buffer cache was really expensive because that would be a million separate lookups. Furthermore, the cache couldn't hold a million blocks. So the odds that many of those blocks would be on disk already was very high. And we wouldn't be able to utilize nice big multi-block reads because we'd have to read a couple of blocks from disk, get a couple of blocks out of the cache, a couple more from disk, a couple from the cache, and so on. So parallel query started by checkpoint, get to disk, full scan. With 11G release two, we have three different ways to process the table with parallel query now. The first one is if the table is really small, really small relative to the machine, we're just gonna use the buffer cache in the conventional sense, just like a transactional application would, nothing special. If the table is really large, cannot fit in memory at all, we're gonna do it the old-fashioned way. We're gonna checkpoint, we're gonna get the blocks out of the cache, and we're gonna use direct reads from disk. The new capability is if the table in a compressed format could fit in the buffer caches you have available. You know, you could be running on real application clusters. It's going to read that table. It's going to load it into the SGA. It's going to load it in a contiguous fashion in the SGA in a compressed format so that the second time somebody goes to read that table, we read it right out of the buffer cache. We don't read it from disk anymore. So if you have a lot of sizable tables, but they can fit in the SGA, the first time we full scan it, we're going to read it and put it into memory. And the second time we full scan it, we're just going to get it out of memory. So these are three new parallel query things. Now for number 10. It's a feature called addition-based redefinition. This feature is so cool that I made it 10 and 11. Okay, so it, it's interesting that the killer feature, I believe, for 11G release 2 is a feature of the database. It's not an option. Everybody will have access to this. Standard edition, enterprise edition, everything. And this is a database feature that allows us to have more than one copy of many objects in a schema at the same time. I can have in my schema two stored procedures named P. One of them's for version one, one of them's for version two. I can have multiple versions of the code in there simultaneously. And this allows me to upgrade my application online. In the past, if a DBA tried to create or replace a stored procedure while somebody's running it, he would get blocked because somebody was running it. And they would start blocking other people. It was impossible to install code into a running database while others were executing it. I couldn't do grants. I couldn't do create or replaces. I couldn't update a view. I couldn't fix a trigger. I couldn't do anything without kicking everyone out. With this, they can stay in while I'm doing this. So in this quick example, I create a user demo, give them minimal privileges, and then I'm creating this new thing called an addition, version two, as a child of or a dollar base. Or a dollar base comes with the 11G release two. That's the default version. I've just created this new version two. Now, as the application owner, I come in, install my application. Hello world, I'm version 1.0, another stored procedure that calls this. And this goes into or a dollar base. Because by default, the database is just using that version. Execute it, it does what you imagine it, it would do. Version one runs. Now I, I found a bug in this application and I, I fixed it and I'd like to install it. So what the DBA would do is give me the permission to version my code and then allow me to version my code into this version two schema. I can now log in, alter my session to version two. I look in the data dictionary, I can see my two stored procedures. They're in or a dollar base. Create or replace my procedure. I now have one in or a dollar base and one in version two. But the old one is still there. I didn't overwrite it. He is still there. In my session, because I'm in version two, I see the new code. If all I do is I log out and log back in, by default, I'm in order dollar base, and the old code is still running there. So I stage all my changes, get everything ready to go, and then with one command, I cut over to the new release. Everybody sees the old code. Only people in version two see the new code until I release it. So this allows you to effectively have two versions of the application in the database at the same time. And I'll just close up with a quick how to get to 11G release two. This is the last one. If you're on the terminal release of 9IR2 and 10G release one, 
you can do a direct upgrade to 11G release two. Otherwise, anybody who's at or above 10.2.0.2 can do a direct upgrade to 11G release two. So that concludes my presentation on 11 things about 11G release two. I hope you found at least one or two things that, that piqued your interest. We're going to take a break now, and when we come back, I'll be doing an hour on some PL SQL stuff. Okay? So I'll, I'll turn it back over.